Welcome to the Meant to Be Outdoors podcast, where our goal is to connect listeners to the great outdoors with hosts Brian Hoffmeyer and Ben Brandell. I'm host Ben Brandell, owner of Meant to Be Outdoors, instructor of outdoor skills, and passionate about personal growth. I'm host Brian Hoffmeyer, wildlife biologist and avid outdoorsman. Welcome back to the Meant to Be Outdoors podcast. I'm your host Brian with my co-host Ben, and in today's episode, we're going to be discussing wild game meats. Some people love them. Some people really don't like them at all. We're going to be kind of talking about which ones are good, how to cook them, how to clean them, and how to store them. But before we get started, we need to give thanks. This past weekend was Christmas, and my thanks is for Jesus Christ, for what he did for you and I. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, which he really paid for my fine and your fine, and um, that allows us to have an eternal life and to live with him eternally. And that is the best gift a man can receive. So thankful. I I know people have heard that time and time again every time this year, but stop and think just a minute like how amazing of a gift that truly is. Yeah, and, and I hope everyone had a chance to, to stop and reflect over Christmas. I hope everyone had time to enjoy the gifts that our God gives us, whether it was good food or time with family and friends or maybe just the vehicle to be able to travel uh, there's a lot of things we take for granted, but everything we have is, is because of him. But ultimately, uh, the most important thing, like you shared, Ben, is is that we have the opportunity at eternal life because of his sacrifice on the cross. Uh, and that is like the best thing to be thankful for. Um, you know what I'm thankful for today? Uh, Christmas was awesome. Um, but I, I love the, the winter season because of fires and a fireplace. Mm-hmm. It seems so simple, but there is so much to enjoy about a good fire in the fireplace. If it's a particularly on a cold, like kind of gray, dreary day, if you can start a fire in your fireplace, hear the crackle of the wood, smell the burning of the wood. Some wood smell better than others, yeah. but to be able to get close and feel the heat and warm your feet and hands and share that with, with family, sit, cuddle up, watch a movie by the fire. It is just really a a time of calming and peace for me. We always had fires growing up as a kid, so maybe that's why. But I, I love it. I I love all all aspects of in details of having a fire in the fireplace. (laughs) You know, you just reminded me, and this is a tip: don't wear your favorite shoes that have Gore Tex and and are made with rubber that's then applied with a glue, because (laughs) when you place your feet by that fire. (laughs) you will ruin a good pair of shoes. So yeah. be Mo- careful in that. Most of your outsoles on your shoes are glued oh. on these days, and you will screw it up They before. can become unglued real quick <laughs> yeah, if you get can. too close to a fire. They can. That is true. Well, in today's episode, we are going to be talking about wild game meats. Now, Ben, I absolutely love wild game. Like There are times when I, I just crave it. If I don't have any, I just want to go out and harvest what season it. I just want to go harvest anything. A lot of people just like to hunt just because it's it is it's fun. It's a great sport to mm-hmm. go out, uh, the pursuit and the actual shooting and the harvest. But I love the whole thing from beginning to end, the the butchering of the animal, the cooking, trying out all different recipes. But, man, when you get to sit down in the very end of the hunt, like that is the last part of the hunt, is to take a bite and enjoy that wild natural flavor that the reason it's on the table is because you got to go do it. It's so gratifying. It's so good. I love you and I were discussing how many different types of wild game we've tried. We couldn't even come up with a number uh, because of opportunities that we've been blessed to have. We have tried countless types of wild game, Uh, some good, some not, some bad, but trying all those flavors, there's, it's, it's special. I really enjoy wild game. Brian, you've been talking about wild game meat, but I think it's important to, to define it like we do a lot of things because wild game, you know, actually when people hear wild game, sometimes they think, ooh, right? So what is wild game and what's wild game meat? And please share with us too, um, you know, you and I, we have been blessed to work in, in many places where we've got to go out and hunt and we've got to enjoy that that meat, that reward. But also some places we worked are starting to sell more and more wild game. Well, and and that's another reason too for this this topic on this episode. Wild game meat is getting more attention; is becoming more popular. More chefs are using it. I have no idea how they 
came up with this statistic. No idea. But they say, and this is an article I found, that 115% increase over the last few years in wild game on restaurant menus. So restaurants are adding it to their menus, and they would not do that if there wasn't a market or an appeal for it. If they're not going to make money off of it, they're not going to add it. So people are seeking out. There is some kind of novelty to that. I have been a part of and worked on properties that had restaurants that are putting elk and bison and and some of these more uh, uh, healthier, lean red meats on their menu and, and really doing well, making really good profit and having great margins because of high sales on these wild game meats. Yeah, I've even, one example, you know, people may not believe that walleye is in that category, but, you know, you have Culver's, it's a fast food chain, and there'll be times a year where they sell walleye, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, we went to a fish house the other night, and walleye was on the menu, but they you don't know what the price is. It's all about the market price, right. so you have to ask during that day. So you are starting there. I am at least starting so to see no a lot more So there's no price listed on the menu? No, it says MP. <laughs> you have to ask them and they will they will tell you what the market price is that day. Wow. of the of the fish. Wow. Yeah. There, so there there must really be a demand for it. I like to define wild meat as and it's probably too simple, but anything not domestic. Yeah. So if it's not being farm raised, then it's wild. If you have to go out and hunt it or collect it, then that is wild game meat. And I think a, a large distinguishing factor there is that people are removed from the life of this animal until the harvest. People aren't giving these animals food. People aren't giving these animals medicine. I think that is a huge thing that makes wild game wild game. And I think that's a big reason why people are seeking it out because yes. people haven't been involved. Yes. You know, farming these animals, there, there are animals that may have been farmed And I kind of want to separate even some of those out. Like even today, I I do believe that catfish is a wild game meat. However, most catfish reading at restaurants, they're not, they're not wild. They're, they're farmed. And so today really kind of getting into the, the true wild game side um, Mm -hmm. that I think you, you define it well that the humans didn't have a, they they didn't play a role, play a role in their development, raising raising (laughs) the animal. Yeah. Yeah. This animal had to get its own shelter, its own food, um, and if it got sick, then it had to take care of itself or die. And humans were not intervening in the life of this animal. That That is wild game to me. Um, so to, to see an increase, like you're talking about, 115% increase in, in these restaurants, mm-hmm. we can quickly identify that they're, they're doing it because they're making money. Yeah. But we also live in a culture where, man, I get this feeling sometimes that... I have to be careful who I tell that I eat wild game yeah. meat around. And so that kind of leads to my question, like, should we be harvesting and consuming this wild game? Well, if you've listened to the Men's Be Outdoors podcast before, you probably know that Ben and I, we like to turn to the Bible when we get should we questions. Mm-hmm. Should we be doing this? Is it okay? Our reference for that for us, our thermometer is scripture, God's word. So I would like to read two verses out of Genesis to answer the question, is it okay to harvest and to consume wild game meat? The first is Genesis chapter 9. This is verse 3. It says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Now, it says everything. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, not everything that moves tastes good. (laughs) But if you needed it for sustenance... It's okay. And this is God the Father saying that, like, it's okay. I am giving you everything that moves. It is okay to harvest it and cook it and eat it. You will find in Romans also, uh, I'm not going to read the verse, but you'll find in Romans as well where it talks about unless, it kind of gives an unless to this, it's a stumbling block for a brother. If, If you are trying to share Christ or God's word with someone and you harvesting animals would be a stumbling block, putting up a barrier between them, then you shouldn't. You should remove it. Nothing that you do should cause a brother or sister to stumble. That would be the one caveat that I would want to add to that. The next verse in Genesis that I would like to read to answer this question, is it okay to consume wild game? Is it okay to hunt and harvest wild game? Is Genesis chapter 27. This is also verse 3, and it says, Now... Therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, 
and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Now, when you see therefore, we're supposed to back up and see what it's there for. And this is actually Isaac. And Isaac is old and he is talking to his oldest son, Esau. And he's basically saying, look, I'm blind. I can't see, but I want to live a little longer so I can keep on teaching you and raising you. So I need you to get me some really quality food to live off of to keep me alive. And his instruction for that is to get wild game and to go hunt it. Uh, So I think what God's telling us there, one, it's okay to hunt it too. It's good for you because even when you're old, it's going to help give you the life that you need to to keep going. You talked about that it's quality. You just, you just, you made a bold statement there that it's quality food. So what makes it quality to you? which I believe then it's, it's going to be quality for everybody. Right. But what makes it quality for you? Why should we consider eating this wild game if it's – what is the quality? Ben, in the world of the internet, if you go online and you start trying to figure out what is okay to eat, what isn't, what gives you cancer, what doesn't, what foods to stay away from, mm-hmm. I mean, you are going to be so confused. Your head's going to be spinning like a top on your shoulders – trying to understand and make two cents out of what you read online. We live in a world today where food is more accessible, especially here in the West, than it has ever been in the history of Earth. And a lot of that is because of this human intervention, what we are doing to food. But people are starting to realize with the increase in illnesses, chronic illnesses, fatal illnesses, that what we are doing to preserve our food and make it accessible isn't good for our bodies. Mm -hmm. It isn't good for our long-term health. With wild game, again, I'm defining that as it hasn't had the human intervention. Wild game has never been affected with steroids. If you go buy meat from the grocery store, there is a good chance that in the name of profit and production, it hasn't been injected with steroids so that the meat, these animals grow faster and produce more meat per bird or per, per animal. I was thinking chicken in my mind, that's why I said bird that they're injecting these animals with steroids. Well, wild game is not getting any steroids. Also, if you are a farmer and you are producing meat for a living, if these animals get sick, you lose money. Mm -hmm. So guess what all, most, a lot of farmers, unless it's considered certified organic, they're giving antibiotics to these animals. Sometimes... A lot of times, just preventatively, they're not even giving it to sick animals. It's just the standard. They come through, they get their antibiotics so they don't get sick, so they can stay in production, so they can sell them and make money. Also, all these animals are being fed genetically modified grains over and over. It may be 90% of their diet for their whole life. Now, that is a whole nother huge umbrella and debate to get into genetically modified plants, but if you are against that, if it isn't okay, wild animals, they're not getting those. They're not, they are not eating and consuming genetically modified grains. And I really just view wild game as food the way God intended it. The, the way Isaac talks about it in Genesis chapter 27. Like, go get me these animals the way God made them to go live in nature and bring it back to me. And I know that I'm getting good, clean nourishment for my body you know (laughs) i'm laughing because today as of this moment recording this podcast we have food that we as humans have access to that kind of reminds me of what you're describing you said you want to go down the road of of these genetically modified modified foods for our animals because then we turn and eat the animals but i feel like (laughs) humans are already starting to make these modified foods for humans. Yeah. And I'm starting to see more and more and more of it. I have never tried it, and I don't ever intend to, but I'm starting to hear a lot of this impossible beef. Yeah. And when it first came out- It's a meat substitute. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a joke. No, restaurants are serving. Yes. I mean, fast food chains. Fast are, foods I are. think there's an impossible uh, Whopper. You yeah. get the impossible Whopper at Burger King. Yeah. And- <laughs> When I started trying to like figure out what does that that mean, I started looking up the ingredients. I wanted to see what was in it for the for the impossible for the impossible. Is it called a burger? Is it 
It could be. I know Impossible Beef is is what they're putting in the okay. Impossible Burger Whopper. Okay, right. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to read to you the ingredient list for the Impossible Beef. Basically, please do. Starts off with water. Then we have soy protein concentrate, sunflower oil, coconut oil, natural flavors, which I don't know what that is. Two <laughs> percent or less of methyl cellulose, cultured dextrose, food starch modified, yeast extract, soy lahiomoglobin. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good effort. Salt mixed tocopherols, which is an antioxidant, l tripothin, and soy protein isolate. But then... <laughs> <laughs> then they got to add in some vitamins and, and minerals. Right. So they add in zinc, gluconate. Uh, Probably B12. Niacin. Yeah, you have your B1s, vitamin B2, vitamin B12. Yeah. And then pyro, pyridoxin hydrochloride. Wow. That sounds like a chemistry lab. <laughs> it is. It's scary. Wow. Now, I don't know about you. I feel qualified to tell you the ingredients in deer meat. Venison. Yeah, what's in it? I'm going to read the venison okay. ingredient list. All right. Venison. <laughs> <laughs> it's deer meat. Really? Yes. You didn't now, have to a lot it. of those vitamins that you read are, are going to be present there naturally because God put them there, created them to be there. But all of that other stuff, whew. Yeah, and who knows what any of that even truly does to our bodies, mm-hmm. and I'm going to stick with venison, and I'll let you keep the impossible, you know, <laughs> burger. I don't even know what to call it. Well, <laughs> there's uh, it's funny because there's a word. It's called H E M E, and I don't know if you say hemi. <laughs> you have hemi there, so they share that the flavor from hemi. And then they say that that is the molecule that makes meat taste, well, meaty. So they're taking this hemi and adding it in so that it can maybe taste or is, so it's supposed to taste like meat. meat. Right. And, and and for health health reasons, there are people who, who can't consume meat. They, they aren't able to digest it. There are people who are... Uh, allergic to red meat, like if they have alpha gal syndrome, if they've been bitten by a tick, and and things like that. Those substitutes like that are 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 great for them. But if given the choice to take something that is single ingredient versus all these ingredients that you can't even pronounce, um, I think it's pretty logical to assume that the single ingredient found in nature would be the most beneficial for your body. You know, th- one of the largest reasons for me to consume wild game is the entire process. I've already mentioned it once, but it is so gratifying to complete the field to table process, to go out to the field, harvest the game, bring it home, process it, put it in your freezer, thaw it out, cook it. It is such a gratifying feeling. People that aren't even involved, like if just the people you're sharing with it get excited about like, oh my gosh, you're serving me wild game. to My son's, love when we eat deer meat, which doesn't matter what cut it is. It's deer steak. They call everything deer steak. Dad, can we have deer steak tonight? But they think it is so cool because they know that I harvested it. They watched me butcher it in my garage. They helped me wrap it in freezer paper and put it in my freezer. It is more enjoyable to them. And they weren't even, (laughs) they didn't even do the whole process. Yeah. And that's, there are people that don't struggle with being a part of the whole process and then eating it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where that comes from. I don't know why. Is there an option for them? Can they get wild game? Well, I think they're, I think not knowing sometimes where it comes from allows people to eat it. Like they're more willing to eat it at a restaurant when it's prepared and mm-hmm. looks really good on a yes, on a plate. You I agree. Know? Um, but another thing that really gets people is, is when they name them. So, you know, if you have a problem, don't name your animals that you're planning on eating, mm-hmm. period. Um, which humanizes them. We've had a podcast yeah. about that. Check that out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you. There are people that struggle eating wild meat, but I also think that if they were to see the step by step 
process of domesticated animals from our beef to our chicken, which Mm -hmm. I think we consume that more than anything, right? Right. If people really saw the process of that, they would probably have a hard time eating it too. Especially with what you're saying, that how these animals, how they are raised. You know, you you shared a story with me um, outside the podcast about how you worked for a, a, a guy that wouldn't, was you were basically going to get in trouble if you ran the cattle? Yes, yeah. Because you that didn't want them to right. have any muscle, any firm muscle. What is it? Right. So a lot of cattle ranchers are really they try really hard to make sure that while they are raising their cattle, that these cattle never run. They don't want to build. The, the meat, the muscles, they don't want to build it up big and strong and tough. So they don't want dogs chasing them. They don't want coyotes chasing them. They don't want uh, humans with their trucks coming in and scaring them, making them run across pastures. They want them to live a, a couch potato life, mm-hmm. walking around, walking to the feed bin, walking to the water hole, laying in the shade. They don't want them to live any type of wild animal life. They want them to live a domestic life because they will make more money for the quality of meat that's being sold. Yeah, you know, I'm more apt to eating a the tongue of a cow if I didn't have it sitting there in the jaw. Like, mm-hmm. I've been overseas before, and I can't remember exactly where I was at, but they had roasted a an entire pig. And that took me a second to kind of get my mind like, all right. And, cause, and all, yeah, because yeah. you're, you're actually taking tongs and you're pulling it off of this pig that's laying before you, this whole pig. But I, I, do, I do understand how people could struggle. I'm remembering now, like when I was a kid, um, the very first squirrel I ever ate, uh, when you skin it, well, that's how you fry it. Like you leave the bones in it. You don't, you don't remove the, yeah. the meat from it. And so you have this figure, this whole body, yeah. whole body yeah. squirrel that you're about to eat when you just harvested it and, and cleaned it and saw the whole process. So I can actually see as people are understanding that it is so much better for you. This wild game is better for you than domesticated mm-hmm. meats per se, that, it is a whole lot easier to eat it when someone has prepared it for you. And and also, for people that don't want to complete the whole field-to-table process, it is more work. Some people may not want to actually go out and, and kill an animal. There, with our connected world and internet and shipping that we have now, there is a market for it. You can actually purchase some different types of wild game meats and have it shipped to you. Sometimes there's markets around where you live that have it available. It is more expensive. It is more expensive because it isn't as readily available as beef and chicken and everything you can go down to Walmart and get. So you are going to pay for it. But man, even if it's just a special treat you do sometimes, I I think it's worth it. it. It's a special reward. I do know people, though, that have tried wall game before. They've tried it. But after trying it the first time, they didn't want it again. And that confused me because some One of my done. F- first times of having it, I'm like, this is amazing. But I, I guess I'm realizing it's the palate of some people. Um, why is it, Brian, that some people may not like it after they've tried it? Well, the number one complaint you're going to hear is that it's gamey. And, and we're really talking about people who they're open to eating wild game. They have nothing wrong with it. But then they eat it and they're like, ugh, that isn't really for my taste palate. Yeah, that word gamey is... It's something I hear a lot. You it, know, it's, it it's has gamey. a negative connotation, but it, it didn't really start that way. Like the word gamey is used to describe a flavor, but over time it has got this negative connotation to it. Right. And and what I can think of right now is just an example to help people understand is is elk. Elk, to me, I love it, but when I've offered it to other people to try it, they'll be like, wow, that is gamey. And because of that, people have tried to then do things to this meat to take that gamey taste away, but what's actually making it game? Like, I don't understand what, what that is. It's gamey. So wild game, especially the red meats that you're talking about, like elk and venison, they have higher iron content in them because these animals are living an active lifestyle. They aren't living the domestic couch potato lifestyle. Like I mentioned, these animals over the course of their life, they're going to have a higher heart rate. So they're actually producing more lean muscle mass and less fat, so it's going to have this kind of irony. I'm going to call it gamey, really. I don't even really want to use the word gamey because I feel like it sets people off with that negative connotation. Some people like that flavor. Um, But any any place that there is skin and fat and connective tissue, that is where that gamey flavor is really going to be housed, which 
when we get into talking about butchering, we're going to see how essential it is uh, to really go about that process the right way. But really, the wild game just the word gamey just truly means a more strong, bold, um, intense flavor. Yeah, when we talk about mammals, you know, there's a few I didn't care for, but most mammals, when you identify it as gamey, I I like it. But an area that I have found, like with my palate, where I don't enjoy is, I'm just going to say right now, salmon. (laughs) People love salmon, absolutely love it. But to me, that tastes what I would use as gamey. It's Mm. uh, fishy. It's, It's fishy, like... Um, and, and, you know, it's so strong of a flavor that I would prefer to find other options, um, on a menu or even at home. Right. And where people then call me silly or crazy because they can't get enough of salmon and they pay these outrageous prices for it at at a restaurant. Right. And, and again, I think that goes into, to how it's prepared. Uh, it's some ways it's going to be more gamey than not. Every time I have salmon that in my opinion is overcooked, oh. It, it it does taste really fishy to me. I love the the strong flavor of salmon. Uh, I'm one of those people that that pays the extra money for the the expensive cut of salmon. I I love that. Um, but you also have, like you mentioned, with catfish, farm raised and, and wild caught. Right. And you get a difference there. You do. Um, in the oil that is in it, they eat, they're eating different things. They're living that different active lifestyle. Um, one animal is g- probably going to be much older than the other one. And that, that is another reason you get these different flavors too. When you are going to the store and you're buying beef or chicken, or even if you're getting into other poultry, it's like a, you can buy a goose. All these animals are way, way, way younger than the average animal that you're going to harvest if you go hunt. For example, chickens, domestic chickens are harvested at six weeks old. Six weeks, a month and a half is when they're harvested. So if you buy a whole chicken, it's only six weeks old. They grow really fast and all the steroids and antibiotics keeping all anything that would inhibit growth out of their systems. They grow fast. They harvest them six weeks old. Now, if you go out and you harvest, I'll say something similar like a grouse or a wild turkey, on average, they're going to be at least two years old. Two years. Sometimes four, five, six years old. So imagine all of the more dense, strong muscle tissue that they've built just because of age on top of a lot of activity. I don't know, Ben, if you've ever paid attention to uh, a domestic turkey, particularly like the the leg and wing area, all the tendons and ligaments, they are so much more thick. You can hardly even eat some of the pieces on a wild turkey that you could eat on a domestic turkey because they're active. They're active and they're older, and that does bring some stronger flavors. Yeah, I had a hard time. I was down in Texas at a, it's called a, that's a swap meet. This is Canton, Texas. It's a huge swap meet. And they were selling some turkey legs there. But what sparked my my interest was that how massive, I'm talking is one of the biggest turkey legs I have ever seen. And I had to have one. It mm-hmm. looked, I was starving and it looked delicious. And as I started to, to bite into that thing, I began to realize like, it was really, I couldn't hardly get to the meat through the tendons. Like right. I almost had to use my fingers on this thing instead of just eating it like corn on the cob, you know, or like an actual chicken leg. Like it, they must have let these birds get a lot older for them to get bigger. And then by that doing it, it, it wasn't as enjoyable as I had hoped. Right. I'll just say it that way. It, it was just too tough. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, uh, anybody that has ever raised their own chickens, if, if you let them get to two, three years old, sometimes the, they will get past their egg laying stage. And a lot of times people will harvest them back in, homesteaders still do this back in our pioneer days. Nothing could go to waste. Those are crock pot birds. Like the only way to cook them is for a long time with a lot of liquid in a crock pot. You can't just take them and grill them like you can one of these six-week-old birds that was harvested domestically. I mean, they are old and they're tough, and you have to prepare them differently, and the flavor is different. You have to add a lot of extra flavors, a lot of garlic and butter and anything that you can add to it to make them uh, really consumable. You know, you can go to the store and you can buy a goose. Again, you're talking like a year old or less when these goose are harvested. If you go out and we go goose hunting, 
they live for a long time. We could go out and shoot a 25, 30 year old goose and bring that thing home to eat it. Yeah. It isn't going to be the same flavor as the six month old one that we bought at the store. It's going to be completely different. I mean, you could almost, not almost, you could fool somebody in that it is two different types of animals and really isn't. Yeah. And, and, you know, fish is that way for me. Um, you know, I love to go catch white bass and, the cool thing about white bass is they are they are fatty like a salmon. So let me, let me show the differences. You have fatty fatty fish and you have lean fish. And in this fatty fish, like uh, the white bass, you'll have the the fatty part, which I call it the red meat, runs through the middle of it. And because I don't like salmon, I'm not a huge fan of mm-hmm. the middle of this white bass yeah. either. But I I'm I'm able to cut that out if I choose to to just have my leaner fillets. But I think that's why I lean. To, uh, I lean more towards lean meat in regards on the fish side because it doesn't have that that taste, that that fatty taste. And so it's consumable. But for me, I understand that if someone was to buy this for me, like I'm going to eat it. It's mm-hmm. just I just don't enjoy it as much. But I have heard there are ways to prepare it all differently, even in even what you're talking about, even duck, goose. Um, you know, elk and, and deer, right. like there are things that you can do to maybe enhance or tr- maybe change the flavor a little bit. Well, that's what I want to encourage all the listeners with. Maybe you are the one that's like, man, I want to buy in to what these guys are saying. I want to eat wild game because it is healthier. Be- it, it is good, but I just can't get over those strong flavors. <laughs> yeah. I can't get over it. There are lots of factors that make it gamey and things that you can do to make it less gamey, to to reduce some of those strong flavors, to change the texture, to make sure that it's nice and tender, to get rid of some of those natural flavors. There are some things that you can do, and we're going to cover those now. And the first thing I want to cover is butchering. Uh, you can either do this yourself mm-hmm. with large game animals like deer, or or you can pay someone to do it. And it plays how this animal is butchered plays a huge role. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk directly about venison. That is what I probably am most experienced with the most in handling personally. First of all, when you harvest an animal, whether it be a squirrel, a deer, a turkey, within about 30 minutes, rigor mortis is gonna set in. And that rigor mortis is gonna last a couple days. If you do not allow that rigor mortis to subside, which is that everything, all of the connective tissues and muscles, they just really get tense up. We've all seen something that is deceased and it's just stiff as a board. That doesn't last forever. It does go away. So you have to keep the meat cool around 40 degrees until that rigor mortis has passed. And then you will be able to tell, you literally be able to go up and push on a muscle of that animal and you will feel that all of, all of a sudden it's now soft and squishy again. Squishy. Is that a word I can use on a podcast? Yeah. Squishy. Yeah. It's, it's now soft and squishy again. And now you know you, you this rigor mortis is subsiding and obviously meat that is not stiff to the touch is going to be more tender. So there's something I had to do this year. Um, our temps were, were going high and low. We were hitting... 40s on one day and then we we're hitting 60s you know a few days later and so i hung my deer actually i hung my son's deer he's the one that harvested it not me um i let it set for almost three days but the temps were starting to to rise and i knew i wouldn't be home and mm-hmm. i it was in my garage and i knew that it would hit whatever outside temp is it's yeah. it's pretty much how do you hit how do garage. you monitor the the temp of of your meat while it's hanging so i don't actually and i could be doing this wrong i don't care about my meat as I have a thermometer in my, um, uh, I use a grill thermometer actually, but, uh, I just pay attention to what the thermometer, what the temperature is in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. I don't pay attention to the, to the meat itself. I could, mm-hmm. I could take a thermometer in and, and do that. Um, but in my environment, I'm hoping to keep it in that 40 degrees when I can't though, this is what I ended up having to do is I went ahead and process my deer but then I put it in the fridge and I, I let it set there for at least another day and a half mm-hmm. to make sure that the rigor mortis continued um, to go away because I, I couldn't leave it hanging for that long. Yeah. You want to keep it around that 40 degrees. 
and it does not have to be hanging. It is best. Like if you can leave your animals out, if it's cold outside and you can keep them outside or put them into a, a hanging cooler, leave it on the bone. I think that that is best. If you are able to actually skin the animal and put it in a, a cooler, a lot of ranches now will have walk-in coolers. That's optimal. Mm-hmm. That's optimal. Mm-hmm. I like to leave my skin on. If I can get the animal cooled down, if I can get the meat cooled down, I like to leave the skin on because then once it's cool, that's the, the fur and the skin will actually help keep it cool. So for example, a lot of times um, in the fall and early winter here in southern Missouri where we hunt, we'll have these cold nights where it's 25, 30 degrees, and then the next day it's 50. And the meat will have cooled down because it's been out hanging, but then it does have that opportunity during the day to warm up if it gets too hot. So I like to try to keep it in the shade, keep it hanging, get it cooled down that first night to get the meat, the carcass below 40 degrees, and then I monitor it with the skin on, and I use uh, an infrared thermometer. And I'll actually just go in and, and I'll shoot inside the rib cage. I'll usually shoot the tenderloins or something and to make sure that we're staying around that 40 degree mark. Otherwise bacteria can really start to build and grow. And if it does start to get up, you know, 45 creeping towards 50, you need to get the meat off the bone. Even if you just quarter it out, it needs to get into a refrigerator, not a freezer. You don't want to freeze it yet. Yeah. Cause you're still waiting for what? Why would we want to put it in the fridge? Well, you want the rigor mortis to go away, but this whole process of aging is actually going to make the meat more tender and as many as seven days. And some people are going to cut meat off and dry age it for like a whole month. I haven't got into that whole process yet because I hear if you you mess it up, you can ruin your meat and the flavors are supposed to be like so, so strong. It, like the flavors are stronger than even if you just dry age it for three to seven days. Aging wild game is what you really want. Get it in the fridge and then after five, six, seven days, if you're not going to consume it, then you need to properly store it. And usually that includes getting it wrapped in freezer, freezer some kind of safe freezer safe wrapping and getting it into a deep freezer. The reason you're, the deep freezer is important is because it will drop to really cold temps and stay that way. Most of the time because people aren't opening and closing right. it as much as they do like a, a freezer in their house, right. uh, the upper portion of that freezer. So you want to keep it cold and it needs to stay cold for sure. Now, here's something that I think a lot of people overlook. I still, to this day, have people argue with me on this, and really the only way to convince them is that I let them try the meat that I have. <laughs> and honestly, I think the the process I go through with my venison, with my turkey, uh, really any of the game that I harvest, I think the process that I go through with it I think it's really good and I think it's really effective. I have served people deer. They thought it was beef. They didn't even know that it was deer meat. I've served served people deer telling them it was deer and they're they're like, holy cow, this doesn't taste like what I had before. This isn't that gaming. This is really good. Can I have some more? No, right, holy cow, it's it's deer. Holy deer. Holy deer. <laughs> and so that's really what I want to share. And I'm pretty passionate about this. So I'll I'll try to leave some emotion out, but doing it the right way. I'm calling it the right way. That's my definition. Doing it this way, I think it makes such a huge difference in the table fare. Once once you cook it and put it on the table the way it tastes, it, this is huge. You need to take cuts of meat from these animals that do not have large fat and, and skin and, and connective tissue deposits. It's contrary to when you get a cut of beef and we people love tri-tip or that ribeye steak with all the marbling and the fat. Well, those are domestic animals. These aren't the wild animals that we're talking about that live this active lifestyle. You don't want all of this in your wild game meat. I see people take their deer to butchers and they pay expensive, a lot of money, and these butchers give them back cuts of venison that are the same cuts as you would do on a beef cow. And I'm telling you, when they're cutting half, three quarter inch pieces of wild game fat and leaving that on and you're cooking it that way, it isn't going to be very good. Now, I understand there are probably a a select 
amount of people that want it to taste that way. Mm -hmm. But overall, people that are used to beef and domestic flavors, you aren't going to like that. It isn't going to be good for sitting around a table of five or six people and pleasing everybody's palate. You need to get the fat and the connective tissue off. You need to learn to butcher around those fat deposits. What do you do with that meat, though, that's that's left after so, you've taken taken those those sections of meat that don't have the fat or the tendon? Right. Um, so once once you take those sections of meat, you're not done. And I've seen people make this mistake, too. They've done a great job. They've cut around some of the fat deposits. They've cut around the ligaments and the tendons. They, they've got a nice, decently fatty free piece of meat, but they still have left the silver skin or some of that connective tissue, the fascia on this, this muscle, the meat, and they'll wrap it, they'll freeze it, they'll get it out, and they'll put it in their crock pot and they'll cook it this way. Well, all of that connective tissue, all of that silver skin is going to be very gamey tasting. It's going to leave a portion of your cut not tender. So after you butcher and remove all your cuts from whatever animal it is, you need to bring it in the house and you need to do what I call trimming. And you need to get a really sharp, I like to use a fillet knife, like I'm filleting fish. I get it really, really sharp and you just trim all of that off to where all you have left is nice wild game meat, as little as connective tissue and fat as possible. Then you can wrap it and get it in the freezer. Yeah, I've seen actually just a bit on the domesticated like uh, ribs, uh, your pork ribs. There yeah. are people that will leave the, we were calling that silver skin. They'll leave it on. You know, I always I always take mine off. Yeah. Most membrane, time, they call it the membrane. Yeah, when I, yeah. when I purchase that from the store, I still take that off when I'm smoking it. And, and I do that for my venison as well. Um, it, do you know, is there, is that something, do you want to remove all that before you freeze it? Or is it okay to freeze it and then before you cook it, remove it after you thought? I've had it both ways. Mm -hmm. I think removing it in general is great, but I do believe that freezing it on there still adds a little bit of tinge of that gamey flavor to the meat. I think it is essential if you want the most pure, ungamey meat when you cook it to get it off before you freeze it. Good. Okay. Now, there is one thing I left out that is also... This one, it, it has to do with flavor, but it also has to do with your health. Animals, mammals, just like us, have a lymphatic system. Our lymphatic system is there to clean all the nasty junk out of our body. A lot of people will accidentally, it is very unintentional, I used to do it until I learned not to, they will cut meat, and inside these layers of meat will be a lymph node. And in these lymph nodes is like the nasty of nasty in these animals bodies and you don't want to cook that you don't want to you don't want to cook it you don't want the flavor that it adds to your meat so whether it be a, whether it be a deer or elk or a bear learn where these lymph nodes are as you're butchering this animal and make sure that you are cutting them out cutting around them leave them on the carcass please do not cook them in your food it will taste better and will be better for you without the lymphatic system in it while you're cooking it. It, it. it is really pretty nasty. I have noticed a, a huge difference in venison whenever I, there's a rump roast, uh, one of the sections of rump roast, and I learned how to cut it out differently. And as I roll that back, it exposes some of the big lymph nodes back there in the rump of the deer. And I, I love that cut for grilling now. I used to only use that cut in the crock pot because of that kind of gamey flavor, but now I can grill it almost like a backstrap because I don't have that lymph node in there anymore. It has totally changed that cut of meat for me. You know, you listening, if you are interested in processing your own meat, um, reach out to us. We we have access to some videos. Um, they're actually really old videos, to be honest with you, time's flying, but um, we have some videos that are awesome at showing people how to process their, their deer. And what Brian's talking about is is when you get in and you start doing it, it's really not that hard. Mm -mm. It's really not that hard. Yeah. You can follow along really easy. Plus, and you save money. You save money, and you you learn how to do it. like you know the skill. Mm -hmm. You know the skill. You know what the parts are, and it even adds to that gratification. Of oh that, yeah, that feel the table. Like I did every step of this. Yeah, I saved my family money. I know the meat that I'm getting is from my animal. I know that it's butchered and trimmed the way that it should be. And I really like, 
I enjoy the whole process. Like even that two, three hour process of, of getting the animal butchered and trimmed and, and wrapped and into the freezer, it's all part of it. And it really brings a lot of joy uh, to provide food for my family that way. I have spent more time cleaning fish than probably deer because I <laughs> I love to fish and I and I I'm better, I think, at catching fish than I am at harvesting uh, other animals. Um, but I just want to give a, a few tips here on, on fish because I've done a lot of it. And, you know, let's whether it be crappie, um, if you are eating bass, largemouth and smallmouth seem to not be one that, that, uh, that get cleaned and eaten a lot because it's, it's a tournament fish, right? So these species, though, from crappie to white bass, catfish, walleye mm-hmm. um even spotted bass around spotted here bass. a lot of people will keep the yep. spotted bass yep. yeah uh you know no matter what you're doing just some tips there when you're when you're out fishing and, and wanting to keep them for eating number one is is for me as i want to keep it alive up to the point of when i'm going to to clean it that's that's so important to me because if if it does die in your live whale or in your stringer um your fish can spoil, especially yeah. if you're keeping it in that warm lake water. It changes the texture of that fillet. It, well, it will change it, but it can also spoil and be mm-hmm. bad for you to eat. So keep that thing alive until you're until you're ready to get home to clean it or or wherever your cleaning site is. But the second thing is is after you catch this fish, no matter what species it is, try to keep it from bouncing and beating up on the ground. Um, when you start bruising, I mean, those fish, as they're flopping on the rocks and, and the boulders, wherever you're at on the bank or even in the bottom of your boat, mm-hmm. it can bruise your meat. It bruises them, and that changes the texture and and the flavor of your meat as well. So It's like you're reaching in, and you're digging that apple out of the bottom drawer in your fridge, and as soon as you grab it and you start to raise it up and pull it out to eat it, then you bump your elbow on the door and you drop your apple on the floor. Yeah, and then you, and you get a big that, soft spot yeah, on yeah. your apple, and you have to cut it out. Yeah, that's similar to if you're pulling your fish out of live well, and you're planning to to fillet them out. If you pull them up and you're dropping them on the floor, and they're bouncing around in your boat, you are bruising that. You are going to change the texture and probably flavor of those fillets. So try to be gentle with your your fish care. Yeah, and when you're when you're catching and uh, fish just to eat, you know you have to be aware of of the nature of the fish, like how it does. I mean. If you're going out to, to catch a lot of white bass, when you put them in the live wheel, no matter how well you take care of them, they flip upside down and, and they will die faster yeah. than other species. Whereas crappie, I can tend to keep them alive a lot longer. Um, but one thing that I've learned is no matter what it is, uh, once you're done fishing and you have your limit or, or you're just done for the day, I want to rapidly cool them as quick as I can in the water they're in. So let's say it's in my live wheel. I'll go purchase a couple bags of ice and I throw that in. And by the time I get home, they're dead. Yep. And... They are more firm. It's a. It makes it a lot easier for me to fillet out. I'm usually not keeping them whole, and I can fillet that out. And sometimes we just go straight to the fryer from there. They're yeah. ready to go, right? But if you are going to get into freezing it, then it will be even better to freeze uh, when they die quickly and they stay colder and they're not just sitting in that warm lake water that you had all day. Yeah, I want to add to your tip there with the ice on your fish. You need to mix the water and the ice together. Sometimes people will just get bags of ice and they'll mm. just throw the fish on the ice. Mm-hmm. It doesn't cool them as rapidly, but more importantly, it isn't hu- as humane because they die very slowly this way. Now, dying fast isn't only humane. It also increases the uh, firmness of those fillets, so you will get better tasting and better textured meat, but also you're being more ethical and in, in euthanizing them quickly. Um, so mix the water with the ice together, and then put your fish in it. They will sink down in the ice. They'll die very, very quickly, and you'll have a nice, firm, good, fresh-tasting fillet when you get home. They're also a lot easier to fillet that way. Yeah, they are. And in that filleting process of any fish, if you see those darker color meats, those are usually going to be more fatty, Mm -hmm. and then your wider are always going to be that lean. You know, some examples, uh, you can go to the store right now and buy tilapia, and that's your lean and that's that. It doesn't have that fishy taste to it. You know, salmon's got that redder, that dark, fattier meat. Um, it's going to taste more like yep. what people identify as fishy. And so, as you are cleaning your fish, um, take care of it in a way to, to cut out the parts that you don't prefer. And then maybe you can cook them up for the people that do. Yeah. Um, I can cut out the red meat and in, in certain fish. White, and white and, bass and catfish are good examples of that. You'll have a really nice white fillet. And then right down the middle of it, you'll see this just one little seam of red or kind of dark purple colored meat. 
and just real gently. It doesn't always run all the way through the fillet. You can kind of take your fillet knife and get underneath it, pull that red seam of meat out, and yeah. you will have better tasting fish. Yeah. If if I say better tasting, some people do like fishy. Like yeah. we call it fishy and gamey. Mm-hmm. Um, if you like that, then leave it on. It, yeah. it, you'll love the taste. If you're not wanting to eat it though, if you're wanting to save it, if you're not ready to put it in the fryer, um, you know. There are different ways to freeze your fish. Um, I've always been taught to, you know, let's say that I have 15 fillets. I try to split them up so when I thaw them out, I have a, a decent amount to feed with, but I don't have too much that I that I can't eat at all and it, and it goes to waste. Um, but I do freeze my freshwater fish in water, and that was what I was taught to do. Um, today, though, and they're actually reasonably priced, you can buy vacuum sealers and it's really doing the same thing. Um, but what you're doing, whether no matter where you're putting it in a, a tub and you're filling it up with water or a Ziploc bag and you're filling it up with water, what you're actually doing... You're removing the oxygen from, from the environment. So it's not going to oxidize the meat at all. And so by keeping the oxygen off that fish, um, once you thaw it out, you're going to have breakdown. It's it's going to be softer. The flays are going to be softer than if you would have cleaned it um, and, and immediately ate it after you cleaned it. But... One example I can think of for that is when we go sucker grabbing. Yeah, suckers. If yes. you if you fillet those out and score those fillets and fry them right there on the riverbank, oh, you can make yourself sick. I just eat and, <laughs> and so eating and eating and yes. eating because you eat so much. Yes, but because of the the high bag limits on these suckers, you can't eat all that you have unless you have a whole bunch of people. We always end up with some in the freezer. And it is good uh, depending on the species of sucker. Some of them freeze up better than others, but it does change. Like that that meat has a kind of a, a softer, I don't want to say mushy. It has a, a lot oh, it's softer. Been mushy before. Some of it I mean, can be. The hog nose definitely get mushy. Mm-hmm. Um, but just because they're frozen, when if you have the opportunity to cook it fresh, whew, man, it, it really is a lot different experience. Yeah, and then I've been saltwater fishing as well, and and we caught red snapper, we've caught uh, sheephead, and mahi-mahi, we cooked mahi-mahi, which fortunately what we we caught was enough to feed the six of us. So A, it didn't go to waste, and we really didn't have to freeze it, but that was what the guide kept sharing. He's like, if you guys are going to freeze this and take it home, do not freeze it in fresh water. And that kind of confused me because I was like, well, my freshwater fish – I have frozen in fresh water before. Yeah, and they're fine. And they're fine, you know. And honestly, I didn't really get, I don't know the answer. However, if you are in that mindset, if, if you have saltwater fish and you're wanting to freeze them, that's honestly where these freezer, the vacuum seal bags are mm-hmm. perfect for as well. Um, you can freeze them that way and it'll it'll allow your fish to, man, taste better and the texture be better when you thaw it out. Well, there are a few other things that we can do to our wild game meat to make it awesome table fare. Obviously, there's recipes and the process of cooking and all that is out there. Uh, we'll leave that up to you, the kind of different flavors and, and spices that, that you want to try. We'll, we'll, or maybe we need to have a chef on and do a wild oh, game cooking Oh, we got to get us a chef. Somebody yes. better than us because yes. we, are, we, are <laughs> yes. we are not chefs at all. But let's say you've butchered it well. Uh, you've you've trimmed it up, you've let let it dry age, or maybe with your fish, you've put it on your ice and water, and you've got some nice fillets and and cut the fat out, but you're still not quite getting a flavor that you enjoy. There are some things that you can do before you cook it that can pull some of those stronger, we'll call them gamey flavors out of the wild game. The first thing to do, and probably the most well known, is a salt brine. You can soak really any kind of wild game meat in a salt brine. And the the standard ratio for that is going to be a quarter cup of kosher salt to one quart of water. Now that's the ratio because obviously you could need more or less than that. So you will have to add that up. But soaking it in a salt brine in the fridge overnight, maybe just for a couple hours, will pull some more of those strong flavors out of whatever wild game meat that is. Now, I personally... I don't soak a whole lot and I don't like to use a salt brine because it does add kind of some salty flavor to your meat. Some people are going to rinse that off afterwards. In my experience, the more water that my wild game meats have contact with before I cook them, it really is kind of robbing them of some of the flavor that I like. So do know that you are going to change the flavor with the salt brine. Yeah, and you actually change the color of the meat as well. It does. You know, you have this this 
beautiful, like dark maroon color. Mm-hmm. And when you begin to start soaking it in milk, uh, and you're you get done soaking it, when you bring that out, it almost looks like a pale, uh, a pale grayish kind yeah. of color. Like uh, you you definitely change. How, how it's going to taste and what right. it looks like, for sure. So you mentioned milk. That is something that I used to do, particularly with rabbits. So rabbits is another one. If, if you've ever had a domestic rabbit versus a wild rabbit, it is, it is different. It's a very different flavor. Again, age, activity level. I really enjoy rabbit meat. Like I love, it's kind of like a, it's not quite chicken. It's like chicken, but. Kind of like the dark dark meat of chicken, maybe. I really enjoy rabbit, but because I thought you were supposed to and you had to, I used to always soak my rabbit in milk, and I and I I enjoyed it. But then once, because I was just in a hurry, I cooked the rabbit whole with not having soaked it in milk, and the flavor was more bold. There was a lot. I mean, it it I enjoyed that. The milk was working, I guess is what I'm saying. It was pulling some of that flavor away, giving it kind of this more dull domestic taste. So if you want to pull more out, soaking fish in milk, people like to use milk for their fish as well. Milk seems to, I don't know if it's because the calcium and, and some of the proteins that calcium tends to bond to pull some of those flavors out, but milk is another useful thing. Now, another one that people like to use is red wine, but people make a mistake here. People will soak red meats in particular, and red wine, what they forget to do or maybe don't know to do is to cook the wine first. You need to boil your red wine before you soak wild game in it. If you do not, your wild game is going to taste like metal when you cook it. The alcohol binds to something that is in your wild game meat, and it gives it a very metallic-y taste. So boil your red wine burn off all the alcohol, and then let it cool again, and then you can soak your meats in it. Now, what where soaking in red wine is a little different is it actually adds some flavor to it. You are going to get kind of an added flavor, but it will take away from the game. You maybe kind of mask it a little bit. So that is another option, another very popular option for wild game meats. Not so much fish, but some of your deeper colored meats, rabbit, venison, uh, those, those type of meats are good for soaking in red wine. You know, another way to do it is to cook low and slow. You know, the first time, like I said, I already shared my first squirrel squirrel experience, and it was basically as soon as we cleaned it, we rolled it in flour and fried it in a skillet. And this was one of the toughest (laughs) pieces of meat I'd ever tried in my entire life. Now, after learning some things from you, cooking low and slow has definitely improved my flavors in my wild game, um, whether it be my venison backstrap or then maybe even getting into squirrel. Yeah. So I've eaten a ton of squirrel. Mm-hmm. I loved to squirrel hunt as a kid. I was fortunate enough to cross paths with some friends that had some grandmothers that they knew how to cook squirrel. Right. And so I also have had, I used to cook some myself, mm-hmm. had my dad cook some for me, and it was always okay, just kind of fried in the pan. I learned real quick to try to get the younger, smaller squirrels, if you're going to just take them and and fry them in a pan, the big old red squirrels, I stopped harvesting them. I stopped shooting them because they weren't good. It's like you're talking about, just tough. But then I learned the, the low and slow, like you're talking about. And my friend's grandmother, this is my favorite way to this day to eat squirrel. And I, I still enjoy squirrel is squirrel and dumplings Mm -hmm. and she would simmer it she had this big huge pan on the stove and she would get all the gravy and squirrel and just let it sit there and simmer just slowly bubbling for hours and it was so tender and so good i don't think that most people would even have known that it was squirrel squirrel. wow yeah my mouth is watering right now thinking (laughs) about it sadly i hope she left the recipe with someone she has passed she's went to she's went to be with jesus but my goodness I I really gorged myself on some some squirrel and dumplings over the years, but it was good because of that low and slow, low and slow cooking process. And that's where I you know I think a lot of people have probably maybe overcooked a lot of their red meats, um, and and I I'm, I'm a culprit of that. I know that I've even on the grill uh, if I'm on a grill I slap it on and I've cooked it too hot and too fast and and uh, I mean it's good. It was 
I haven't really had a bad one, but when you've had it low and slow and, and you cook it to that temperature that you like, that mid-rare, mm-hmm. especially for my venison, I can't hardly beat that. I That's the way to go. Yeah. You have to remember wild game is more lean, which means it does not have the fat on it to keep it nice and juicy and flavorful at long, high temperatures. So maybe you like your steak medium or medium well, and steak is still a good ribeye, a medium ribeye. I like mine less than that. But at medium, it's still going to have a lot of flavor. But if you take a venison backstrap and you cook it to medium or medium well, you're going to lose so much flavor. You're going to lose so much color in your meat. It's going to kind of just be this gray, and you're going to lose a lot of moisture content. Wild game meat really needs to be cooked medium rare. Everything needs to be cooked medium rare. Make sure you're getting to temperatures that are, are at least killing the viruses and bacteria that could be present. But man, those red meats, medium rare, will retain their flavor. Where people get scared is that these wild game meats will be so juicy at medium rare that there's a lot of red juice coming out. And they say, I don't like all that blood. Well, it isn't blood. The 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 animal has been dry aged for several days and butchered. There is zero blood left in the animal. Uh, it If it is not doing that, it probably isn't going to be very good. Right, right, absolutely. Now- you and I have taken like, let's say that let's use a deer for an example. You and I have taken the back straps, the loins, the the roasts, you know, and we cook them all differently and in different ways. But there's still some meat left on this deer, mm-hmm. and a lot of times we're like, "What do we do with it? It's tough, you know. What, what milk soaking it, all that isn't going to work." And so you and I, we make our own summer sausage. And what I found by doing that process is. If there was even any game in it, by the time that you're done creating the summer sausage taste, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. And no, and I mean, it's it's amazing. And why I love it is it's those quick sticks, man. We can grab and take them. We take them out on the boat while we yeah. go fish we or fish hunting. That's yeah. Our lunch. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's been awesome. Um, but that's another option for people. If they don't enjoy the taste of the way that majority of venison tastes, then have it turned into summer sausage. Yeah. Yeah. Venison or I know bear. So a lot, a lot of people who harvest bear, they won't cut any kind of steaks or, or grilling cuts out of bear. They'll only make uh, breakfast sausages, summer sausages, and jerky. They'll cut it into stew meat and, and cook in stew. And these these meats make great additions to these recipes. They will produce some really good food, but they may not be great for grilling. I know people who will only take the tenderloins and the back straps or loins from their deer and elk. And that is the only thing they keep for their grilling meats and everything else, all the rumps, all the roasts, they either make summer sausage, snack sticks, or hamburger out of all of it. Right. And, and, and that is just their preference. And because of though, when you're adding all of these flavors and fat from other animals and all kinds of seasonings and curing and smoke, it does take away the gamey flavor and it really is gone. So if that's your preference, then then please do that because we do some of that ourselves yes, too. We, do. we do. And it gives you an opportunity to make full use of the animal that you're harvesting. All the little pieces of meat here and there that aren't big enough to grill or like you said, may be tougher and you can't completely get all the fat off of them. You can throw that into these to these sausages and stews mm-hmm. and it won't be gamey because of the process of, of cooking and curing that you're going through. Now, another way... Um I have tried marinades before, but I wasn't a fan. Do you marinate any of your wild game? So it is not my first choice to marinate, but again, I like the flavors. The one that comes to mind for me the most that I actually prefer marinated is duck. And so I, I'm in mallard is really what I'm thinking here, but if you have mallard breasts, and you marinate them in Italian dressing and then do like a quick, almost like they're steaks and you're doing like a minute and a half or maybe two minutes on each side of that breast on a hot grill and you bring it in, oh, it is so good. But you can, you can taste that Italian dressing marinade. So it's kind of masking that gamey duck flavor that is present. Yeah, duck. 
I struggle. That that is what I do struggle with. Well, and you've got your you've got your your divers and mm-hmm. your dabblers. Yep. Dabblers are more considered your herbivorous, and they're they're going to taste better like a mallard. And if you get into like a merganser that is is a diver, you you get these fish oils because they're they're eating. And that's fish. what I was going to say. Any bird that that you are trying to harvest that eats fish, yeah, they taste different. Yeah, than, it, than it birds isn't as good. No. It isn't as good. No. Yeah. So uh, some people, I don't think <laughs> some some duck hunters actually won't shoot divers. Right. Like if if a if a diving species comes over, they they won't harvest them. They are looking for dabbling species only because it has better flavored meat. So that woodsmanship there is actually creating your better table fare. Absolutely right. All right, Ben. I mentioned earlier, you and I before this podcast, we tried to figure up how many wild game meats each of us have eaten and we weren't able to do it because every time we stopped we thought of another one that we tried and so we really wouldn't be confident in giving a total but it's dozens and dozens and dozens for yeah. each of us yeah. things that wouldn't even really be considered table fare we have tried and eaten we have actually got to be a part of wild game suppers put on by our, our conservation department and I mean it is like 40 foot long tables on end full of crock pots and all different kinds of recipes and you're walking up and you're looking at it like, all right, what is this? And then yeah. you get some kind of crazy answer and, and you give it a try, but it's really cool because you get to try all of these flavors. But what I want you to share, Ben, what is the least favorite wild game that you have ever tasted? We defined wild game before we started, but I want to add in a, a, a little more addition to what wild game is. So, you know, you and I, I would love to to try chipmunk one day. <laughs> I would love to to try some of these other animals because, as the Bible says, we we're able to mm-hmm. to eat it all. But but morally, morally, yeah. absolutely right. But here in our states, there are some animals we're not allowed mm-hmm. to hunt, and because we can't hunt for them, what you can't just say, well, it God said it if it moves, you know, in a survival situation, absolutely, yeah. I'm going to, I'll take the fine or whatever. But when we're talking about our normal game species, uh, most people think of what you and I yeah. have been talking about. Squirrel, deer, turkey, deer fish, duck. rabbit, yeah, elk. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of these that we tried whew, were interesting. And my least favorite, I'm going to have to go, I think it was, I think it was the crow. I don't think... I. Because I'm trying to remember the flavors. Because we we tried a lot of them, mm. and we've even harvested some and tried ourselves. Yeah. But I think it was the crow was my least favorite. Um, yeah, I'm going with crow. What was yours? You know, I didn't mind the crow. It it was kind of just eh to well, me. You know, I I struggle because when you watch a crow, they eat anything. Yeah, they eat dead. They eat alive. They eat plant. They'll eat whatever they can just get a hold of. And I don't know. I had a hard time with it. <laughs> yeah, to me, it, it wasn't like, oh, this is gross. It was just kind of like a, oh, well, there's not, not really a whole lot there. Not a whole lot of. To yeah, me, there wasn't yeah. any, anything. I wouldn't go out and pursue it, but yeah, take it or leave it. My least favorite, hands down, was the bobcat. Really? Oh, the bobcat had like this, just like pungent, tangy. Uh, really? I thought it was so gross. Oh man, I I did not like the bobcat at all. Okay, but then I think about like how how like cats are kind of gross to me anyway, <laughs> so that's probably why I didn't like it. Like it, it just the smell of a cat is kind, gotcha. kind of bothers yeah. me. But man, we tried some. We have tried some wild things. Here's I, one of my favorite. One of your favorite. My favorite. Okay, was the beaver tail. The beaver tail was better than the beaver meat. Yes, that's why yes. I said beaver tail. Yes, I liked. I liked it. I like. I wish I could have sat down and had more of it. Um, during that trial, but I'll call that one of the surprising ones. I don't know that it was my favorite, but it was surprising to me. Well, I, I mean, yes, my favorites are going to be deer, elk. I mean, yes. of course, the ones that everyone's ordering at restaurants. But on this weird wild game side that most people don't eat, that beaver tail was was way up there for me because I like bobcat. Yeah, I, I thought bobcat was good. Um, but all kinds of stuff that we've opossum, raccoon. One, you know what? One that that we didn't try that day, but I've had before was um, rattlesnake, and I struggled with the rattlesnake because it was to me it tasted very metallic. Mm. It was like uh, I'm gonna say iron if that's what iron tastes like, but it was so metallic that I just didn't. It wasn't wasn't that great. <laughs> it yeah. was like I, I 
I didn't I didn't mind snake. I wasn't I didn't mind snake really that all. I didn't get the metallic flavor really? from it. Hmm. Um gator. I liked the gator. Yeah, gator I like yeah, alligator. Yeah, Alligator's good. good. Yeah. Um I'm trying to think of any of kind of these uh, other eclectic things that that so, I've tried that may be like holy cow. Yeah, you know, fish that people don't think about gar. I've yeah. had gar before. It was like eating it didn't have much flavor and it was like eating a rubber, like a piece of rubber. It would just I was like, you know, if I was starving, yeah, this would be so good. But it's You just made me remember the carp guy. He fries yeah, carp and yes. it's actually not bad. Not when he does the crazy things to it. Right. But you can still It's yeah. There, he 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 was like, listen, you won't know what's in this, but let me tell you, you can still taste the car. Like, <laughs> there's nothing not, you can do to completely bad. remove it, but it's it not wasn't bad. bad as if just going and making carp, right, yeah, or frying carp, yeah. Um, you know, some others, you know, we've had pheasant, quail, dove, mm-hmm. turkey, crow, all the bass species I know you and I have tried. Uh, you know, I kept talking about white, white bass, but striper, that's another one we've had. Um, you know, it gets into the fish, though, from... The mahi mahi or sheephead, snapper, tuna, red drum. I still think my number one fish that I could eat for the rest of my life is walleye. That's yeah. that's my absolute favorite. I I love it. Properly filleted and cooked walleye is almost like a good chicken finger. I it's just it's brilliant. It's I mean perfection. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It it is it is very very good meat. Now, now have you now have you had because I was trying to recall if I've had moose, mm-hmm. and I, I thought I did, but I can't recall where I would have, have gotten it from. Have you ever had moose? Yeah, I have had moose, and it, it was good. It 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 was gamey. It had it had a strong flavor, but again, most of the moose that are getting harvested are giant bull moose, yeah. and you're getting all this these musky testosterone flavors, um, and. That is something that you need to consider too. Like if you if you are harvesting a dominant whitetail buck or a dominant bull moose that is in the middle of the rut and their hormones are raging, there is gonna be some of that hormone flavor. You know, I'm I'm thinking back to a hunt I was on one time. This is my buddy AJ, and we harvested a a, a hog this day, and this was a huge, huge hog. Over 400 pounds. Couldn't even get into my pickup truck. I shot a buck before this. Right. And after we put the buck and the hog in the back of my truck, my truck, half-ton truck was squatting. Yeah, and to be clear, this happened when you were able to shoot hogs on site. Oh, yes. You know, they've changed some of that now, but this was a day when it was like free range, baby, if you yeah, see them, we, kill them. Yeah, we were in an area, and, and the law was, yeah, if you if you see a hog, harvest it. Like, we're yeah. trying to eradicate them from the area and this hog was so old that it had so old and huge that it had worn its tusk down. But after we harvested it and we started walking up to it, once we got about five or six feet from it, we looked at each other like our eyes were burning. This thing was so musky and stink and nasty. It literally burned your eyes. Yeah. You could not breathe in. And we're trying to grab the legs of this thing and lift it in my truck. And we could not. We ended up having to pull it, drag it up to the top of a pond dam, back my tailgate of my truck to the pond dam, tie ropes around this thing and drag it into the bed of my pickup. And I was so nervous to put my buck that I just harvested around it because I didn't want any of that that smell to yes. get and taint the meat of my yes. buck. Yeah. And so we're like, well, holy cow, this thing is huge. We're going to have a whole bunch of pork. This is going to be awesome but you couldn't even stand around this thing. It stunk so bad. This boar, oh. And so we took it to a butcher and taxidermist, and they were like, look, we can do this for you, but do know this is going to taste just like it smells, and that anything, any kind of pan that you cook this in, you're going to have to throw away because it will smell like this forever. Right. And so we actually, because of that, we decided not to even take the meat. We had the head taxidermied, but we did not take the meat because I'm not exaggerating when I'm telling you, you could not even stand around this animal. See, so yeah, I've never experienced that. I, I haven't smelt that. But you had reminded me of the common snapping turtle. Mm. And we had harvested some of those. That's and, another one we ate. Yeah. yeah. We, and I forgot. That's I didn't. We forgot to add that to our list, but it reminds me of the odor, the odor of that thing. 
because there is a method people will soak them in fresh water, but well, while they're alive, they put them in there, let them to, they say it cleans them out. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I didn't do this. And I'm telling you, it was the most disgusting smelling as you're cleaning it. And, and I just couldn't hardly even eat it. Yeah. I remember I, I couldn't, I, I probably cause the smell was still on my fingers, <laughs> but that was a gross one, man. I, the, the ugh. only, the only way I've had snapping turtle that I've enjoyed was soup. And I could see that. Yeah. It, it goes back to making it like stews and soups. Yeah, that the low and slow mask. cooking. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That was the only way I had turtle that I like actually enjoyed. Ben, I want you to leave the listeners with your favorite wild game. Now, this is probably harder than picking your least favorite. Your favorite and how you like to cook it. If right now, someone was, you didn't even have to do it. The whole process was done. You just got to go sit down to a plate of it. What would it be and how would it be prepared? You know, I'm gonna go on the two sides. I'm gonna say for me, it's it truly is venison, and it's that low and slow of cooking it like a medium rare steak. Whitetail or elk or, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go whitetail because on the elk side, they they've tended to to taste to me more gamier than most venison uh, mm-hmm. than most whitetail that I've had. So, uh, and I like it medium rare. You know, at that is perfection for me. Those loins cooked slow to medium rare, perfect. On the fish side, people have have told me to to bake and to to brine, do all these different things. My absolute favorite is just a fried piece of fish, pan fried or deep fried, don't care. Uh, pan fried, I, I cook it a little slower and a little longer. I love that crispy texture. Um, that's my two, and, and it's simple. It's fried fish is so simple, and it is my absolute favorite. Yes, I'm gonna have to agree with you. On the whitetail venison, the tenderloin, which mm-hmm. is actually, you, you take it from, from inside underneath the spine. It's so tender, such a tender cut of meat. You don't even really need a knife no. to get it off of the bone. You can grab it with your fingers and just run your fingers on the back of it and pop it out of there. Now, it's a couple small pieces of meat, but my goodness. If you let it age for four or five days at 40 degrees and then bring it in and grill it, fast like a minute and a half on each side seasoned up a little bit just some salt and pepper maybe let it rest for five or ten minutes and then slice it thin oh my goodness i I can eat both of them (laughs) off of a deer and something else that i would add to that is people always say a buck is better than a doe or let's shoot these yearlings they're better if you go through everything we're telling you through to do cook it and butcher it and prepare it properly it's going to be hard for you to tell a huge difference between them. It is, and I, and I'll add in, you can tell a difference. That's why we've we've talked in this episode that younger animals definitely are going to be more tender than your older ones. And so even even in harvesting wild game, the younger animals always going to be perhaps less gamey and and more tender than your old 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 animals. <laughs> right. But yeah, if your old animals. If you go do the stuff that we're telling you to do, you can get it close. You can get it close right. to those to those young animals for sure. Well, I guess since you picked a second one, I'm going to pick a second one too. And this wild turkey. Now. Oh, that you said that. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to make you hungry. <laughs> yeah. Some people don't like wild turkey because it is easier to overcook and make dry than, oh, yeah. than, it, than a domestic turkey. Again, age, active lifestyle, less fat. But if you take the turkey breast out of a wild turkey and you cut it into little cubes and bread it, like make turkey nuggets and bread it and fry it hot in a deep fryer. Oh my goodness. Yeah, to wild turkey breast. It even is just, so good. Even just cutting strips and, and throwing Ooh. it in pan fried is, I mean, amazing. So you can mess it up, but it is really good. It is really, really good. So if I had to have a wild turkey, if I had to pick two, I'm going wild turkey and venison tenderloin Those are and good. i'm gonna be a happy happy man let's just let's get together and, and then we can have all three. <laughs> share them all yeah. now we got four <laughs> well while i'm thinking of it i really like some dove meat yeah <laughs> if you can't tell we're excited about wild game you are probably hungry now that you've listened to us talk all about it if you haven't given wild game a chance i hope that you would i hope that you would try it if you still have questions like oh i don't really understand what they were saying or i'm not sure i can execute that Please reach out to us. We would love to help you. We just want people to experience 
wild game to experience food the way we believe God intended for us to consume it and experience it. Get away from some of this store-bought, all kinds of additives. Sounds like a chemistry lab when you read the ingredients. Food, we don't think that you will regret it. Please reach out to us at m2beoutdoors at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram. You can direct message us on there as well. We hope that everyone had a very, very Merry Christmas. We hope that your 2024 is going to get off to a great, great start. Most importantly, we hope that you seek the Creator and that you have a closer relationship with Him when 2024 is over. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. We hope that between now and that time, you remember you are meant to be outdoors. Thank you for listening to the Meant to Be Outdoors podcast, hosted by Brian Hoffmeyer and Ben Brandell. Please help us by subscribing. Also, follow along on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook.